afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, ERISA webinar and the ERISA webinar series. Today, we welcome ERISA Vanguard cabinet member and social media maven Kate Berg in her presentation on building your professional GIS portfolio. Kate is GIS lead at the state of Michigan's Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. This is an exciting topic that aligns with ERISA's mission and goals of engaging and supporting geospatial professionals at all stages of their careers with essential training and resources that help to sustain and strengthen the profession. Uh, Kate has asked that if questions come in, uh, or if you have questions during the presentation, uh, please use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom to, uh, to put those in, and uh, we'll work through those and answer those uh, if we can uh, during the presentation, uh, but we'll definitely come back to ones that, that uh, 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 Kate would like to address uh, after the, uh, the presentation. So with that, uh, Kate, uh, turn it over to you, and uh, let's have some fun, shall we? Yeah, let's have some fun. All right, hi everyone. I'm glad to see you all here. We have over 150 people, that's awesome. I know we have, uh, Wendy said 400 people registered. I'm really excited to share with you guys some insight that I have on building your professional GIS portfolio, uh, what to include in it, as well as some best practices for presenting and sharing your work. So uh, I am Kate Berg. As mentioned, I work uh, for the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Before that, I was GIS specialist for several private consulting firms. Um, I've taught GIS at the university level and minored in it in college. And I currently serve as um, outreach chair for URIS's Vanguard Cabinet of Young Professionals. So you might be thinking, what qualifies me to be presenting today on GIS portfolios? Uh, well, I've been using GIS for 10 years now, five of them professionally. Um, I've been on both sides of the interview process. So being interviewed for a job as well as interviewing um, candidates for a job at, at Michigan. And uh, so I'm familiar with what works and what doesn't. I've also received some recognition for my portfolio. Um, it has been featured on several blogs uh, on creating GIS portfolios, including from Esri, um, from GIS Lounge. And so I'm, I'm pretty confident that I can give you some insight onto how to build your professional portfolio. Now I have links here to two different portfolios. I'll get into why, why I have two in a little bit. Uh, I also have my social media links here and I hope that you feel free to reach out to me if you ever have any questions that weren't reached out, uh, weren't answered today. Um, or if you have a portfolio that you'd like me to check out. And all these links will be at the end as well. So with that, let's, uh, let's dive right in. So today we're going to talk about what is a GIS portfolio, why you should create a portfolio, some examples, how to create your own, as well as some best practices and uh, steps after you've created your portfolio. So before we jump into GIS portfolio specifically, let's take a sec back and look at what a portfolio is in general. Um, so the idea here is that it's a collection of work, whether it's pictures, it's photographs, or examples of your writing, um, things like that that you can use. Uh, in this definition, they use it for entering competitions or applying for work. And if we look specifically at a GIS portfolio, that can include a lot of things that highlight your GIS related skills. So that's um, could be maps, it could be some interactive online content you create, web maps, web apps, um, any special analyses, scripts, toolboxes you create. You can really think of it as kind of a visual representation of your resume. Now, who's the audience for this portfolio? First and foremost, your portfolio is a really great addition to any interview, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but sometimes they're even a requirement for a job application. Portfolios can come in handy if you're looking for a, a promotion at your current employer. And uh, it's also, if you're a freelancer, it's a great way to show off your work and help market yourself better. You can use it to expand your network. You can use it yourself. I found it uh, really useful to refer back to my portfolio when I can't remember when I did something or what I did with something to help um, jog my memory. It's a great thing just for yourself. 
Now, because the GIS portfolio, like I said, is a visual represent representation of your resume, you're able to literally show what you can do rather than just trying to tell um, or summarize your skills in bullets or paragraphs like you might on a resume or, or job application. And building on this uh, show not tell concept, you are demonstrating your technical prowess and knowledge um, with this GIS portfolio. So you're including real tangible examples and um, that helps make people more confident in your abilities, make you a more desirable candidate if this is for a job application. Um, one of the tools that we'll talk about in a little bit is using a Esri story map for your portfolio. And what that's saying is not only do I know Esri technology, I'm proving to you that I know it by displaying my portfolio in one. So it makes you a desirable candidate by proving um, rather than just saying what you're doing. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why I got my current job. My, my manager told me that my portfolio um, was able to reassure him in my abilities and he didn't have to assume or try and guess what I knew. He knew exactly because I had my portfolio and my work in that. Um, so another benefit to creating a GIS portfolio is it, it's simply a more appropriate format for your GIS work. The output of GIS is inherently very visual, so it lends itself well to a, a visual presentation that, that comes across in a portfolio. Um, it's also a great opportunity for you to uh, let your personality come out, share who you are with the world, and in that way kind of stand out from the crowd. Your portfolio can help you shape your personal brand and, and personal branding sounds silly, but it makes you seem more as a, of an authority in this industry and elevates your credibility. And I like it uh, because it acts as kind of like a personal database. So you can use it to see what you've done, assess your own progress in your career and help you identify kind of areas where you can grow and, and improve on. So taken together, your GIS portfolio helps uh, to show your value by highlighting who you are, uh, whether this is your skills or your personality. It can lead to opportunities, help you stand out from the crowd. Uh, oh, sorry, secure opportunities such as with interviews and promotions and things like that, um, as well as standing out uh, from the crowd. Um, I can tell you that in my current job, I've been on several interview panels to hire new staff and uh, only one had a portfolio that they had to share with us. And so I can tell you, it would definitely make you stand out if you had something like that. Um, not a lot of people have them, it seems like. And lastly, again, it's a great opportunity for yourself to refer back to understand where you came from, where you like to go. Um, and one last reason, I touched on this a little bit before, but sometimes it is a requirement. Um, more and more employers are asking for a portfolio of your work to be included in your job application. And uh, we all know that the job search is hard enough, so why not make your life easier? Um, and if you're not currently looking for a job, uh, make life easier for you in the future if things change and you need to market your skills again. And uh, I did a quick search on Indeed for GIS jobs, and here's just a few that require you to submit a portfolio with your application. So even uh, places like the CIA here are jumping on the GIS portfolio bandwagon. But you don't have to take my word for it. I've reached out to my network, both on Twitter and LinkedIn, um, to ask those that do have portfolios, what do you like about it? Um, what do you find useful about it? My portfolio is the single most important asset I had in the early years of my GIS professional journey. This is um, from a principal consultant and GIS group lead, says that his portfolio helps under, um, when he's reviewing, sorry, when he's reviewing portfolios um, for future candidates, it helps him understand who you are and how you might fit into that company. Um, portfolios can help explain the breadth of what you do. They provide employers with super fast access to your skills, great overview of what you do, um, and it's uh, very useful for your interviews. 
One last quote I got here is from Harry. He mentions how useful a GIS portfolio is in helping achieve contracts, get jobs, and ask for promotions. Um, and I really like this part here. You should never really be comfortable in your position. You should always be ready to market your abilities. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, so it's always good to have in your back pocket. All right. And uh, with that, I want to dive in and show some examples of some portfolios to give you an idea of what's out there. Uh, so this first one I have is um, from a product engineer at Esri and her landing page is um, really nice slick showing her projects right off the bat. So you can scroll and see these, but you can also click on them and it opens up a new screen with more details about that project or the project itself. She also has a blog and an about page describing more about herself. Uh, this is a really great one. I love it. The landing page is a description of who she is, what she does, where her passions are. And uh, she's actually broken up her portfolio into a couple different options. She has a GIS portfolio and a design portfolio. And if you click on GIS, I like this a lot because it doesn't just have a picture. We have a nice description of what she did, some highlights. This one was accepted into the virtual gallery at Esri UC, things like that. So you're adding additional context to your work, not just putting a picture there. Adding some text um, can really help add that context and that value. This is a very simple landing page, but it gets you right to where you want to go. If you want to learn about Trevor, if you want to jump into his projects, and this has a lot more details. It's not just like um, the first one where we have like a nice panel of a ton of different projects. This one goes into depth, almost blog like form um, of what exactly he did to do these analysis and his skills. Here's another one kind of like um, the first one where the landing page is all the projects um, that Topi's worked on and you can click on it, see it and learn a little bit more where the data is, what tools exactly um, he used. And then the last two I wanted to show you were mine. So there are two different ones that I have. Um, so this first one is using Esri Story Maps template. Um, this is using their classic template, which has now uh, been retired, which is why I moved on to the uh, a, another website. But um, this is what I got a lot of recognition for. And I think there's a lot of components here um, that could be helpful for you. So the first off is I've broken it up into tabs at the top. So it's really easy to jump into, oh, I want to learn what this person did, what spatial analysis she did. And then you can click here and then you can click through the different special analyses, but I don't just have a picture of it. I am also describing the tools that I used in this, the exact workflow, and I lay out exactly the skills. So, for example, um, this one I'm using a kernel density analysis and really calling out specific things so that potential employers um, will know, oh, I, I don't just say I have GIS. Uh, certificate, I actually can tell you what a buffer is and I can actually perform a buffer, right? Um, so like I said, this uh, portfolio template is no longer being maintained because it was retired by Esri. So I jumped over um, onto the website bandwagon and this is using Wix to create a website. And I have um, a little landing page like this. And similar to the previous ones we talked about, we have an about page. Um, that kind of lays out some experience that I've had, some presentations of mine, my master's project. Um, but the real meat and potatoes is, again, this portfolio. Um, and if you click on a particular item in here, we get more details, the tools, the sources, again, like that. Now, I just created this uh, just a month or two ago, so I, there is a lot of improvements to go on the site, so I will put a little caveat with that. Um, and last but not least, a con connect page so people can connect with you, contact you after they've been so impressed with your portfolio, you wanna make sure that they're able to contact you. All right, oh, there's a scuba diving. Okay, let's uh, jump 
back into the presentation. All right, so you've seen some examples of what a portfolio is. We talked about what it is, um, and now you're ready to start making your own. Here's what you need to know. The first thing that you wanna do is gather all your content. Um, so everything that you wanna include in your portfolio, things like that. Um, and then you have to decide on how you wanna show off your work, what tool you're going to use. And lastly, I want you to have fun with it, add your own flair uh, and really make it your own. Now, I probably should have mentioned this before, but one thing I wanna stress is this presentation is kind of focusing on advice for a digital GIS portfolio. Um, and the reason of that is I, I think that we're moving into a much more environmental, or sorry, virtual environment of late. Um, and I also think that an online portfolio allows you to share your work with a much wider audience. Um, instead of a hard copy portfolio that you have to hand deliver or mail to someone, a digital portfolio is a lot easier. You just drop a link to someone and they can view it not only easier, but more conveniently when they have time to, um, to review your work. So yeah, this is all kind of talking about advice for an online portfolio. All right, so before we dive into specifics of creating the portfolio, I want you to think about the previous examples and what they all had in common. Um, in the interest of time, I didn't show the about page and the contact, contact page of all of them, but um, it's pretty much across the board. Most everyone has these three sections. So the about section is who you are, what you're about, what you've done. Um, some people put links to their resume on there. Some just have a kind of a summary of what they've worked on uh, or where they've worked. Some don't even include the resume on there. It's just kind of like, hi, I'm Kate and here's my work. Um, the contact page sometimes is combined with that about section, but usually includes social media links and email. And that third option is the portfolio. This is the real meat of the whole thing. This is showing your projects and showcasing your work. So really quickly, um, because I do wanna talk more about the portfolio section, but briefly, um, the about and contact sections are important, but um, you can include as much or as little as you want to share in these sections. So I've seen some people include their education, their awards, any certificates, their educational background, um, licenses, and then again, there's that contact section. You want to make sure that you give people an opportunity to reach you once they've been so wowed by your portfolio. I've looked at a couple couple portfolios that were excellent, um, and I was like, oh, I really want to reach out to this person, but there was nowhere to, to find them. So it is really important to make sure that you have some kind of way that people can reach out to you after they've seen it. One thing I want to note is that you should be careful about what you include in here. Um, I've seen some people post their resume and that resume has their home address on it. Um, first of all, I, I don't think that your resume needs to have your address on it anymore. I think that's kind of a relic of the olden days and, and not necessary and sometimes even risky now. So I would remove that if you are gonna post it, uh, your resume on your website. Um, and I would just kind of be wary about what kind of information you are putting out there. All right, so this is the main point of the portfolio is to show off your work um, and all of your past projects, whether it's professional or personal, all in one spot. So you gotta gather all of your GIS content. You wanna look for output maps, screenshots you have of maybe some websites, links, um, and then you want to make sure that you are writing up a description of these projects. So what did you make this? What did you accomplish with this? What tools did you use to make this? Uh, and what school skills did you learn with this? Did you receive any feedback on it? If you did, um, like earned a high grade or you got a promotion because of it, that's definitely something worthwhile to put in there. And I like putting cit citations for data sources. Um, just to give credit where credit is due. Now, it can be the most difficult part um, because if you haven't saved your previous work, it can be really hard to track it down. Um, and then once you've tracked it down, you've got all, some work that you have to decide what you wanna show. Um, 
but I know that you can do it. And the first step I would say is to start checking out your current resume, resume for ideas of what to include. Um, you can look for any public items that you have from your work life, your school, any homework assignments or exercises that you completed. Um, some other good places to look are certification coursework, um, for example, ESRI MOOCs. Um, so if you've created any content for them, that could be a good thing to include. Um, it's kind of up to you what you want to decide to show. Uh, there's not really a limit, but um, it's kind of up to you what you think is relevant, what looks good. Um, I have stuff in my portfolio from 10 years ago because I think that it shows off a certain skill set that I haven't had in kind of more recent work. Um, so you do want to look for diversifying your portfolio, including examples that highlight a variety of work. Um, one thing to note is it doesn't all have to be visual. So you can include projects without a visual example, and I'll get to that in a second. What I want you to do is aim for quality over quantity, though. Um, you want to make sure that whatever you're including in there makes you look good. So don't just include it to, ha to have a bigger portfolio, right? Um, it should, it should mainly be a collection of your best work. Now, a question that I get a lot is, um, I don't have a lot of GIS work to share. So what should I do to fill my portfolio? So this is from people that maybe work um, in private consulting and their work is, is private or they're new to the field, they're young professionals and they haven't really gotten a lot of examples. So how should you start filling out your portfolio? Well, in the first case, if your concern is that your projects are kind of internal or private, I would definitely check with your supervisor or your managers to check if you could include something, if you remove some personal or identifiable information in them. And for those of you that are new to the field or just don't have a lot of real world content to include, um, you can start by getting a little creative. And to be honest, I don't think I have really anything from my professional work in my portfolio. They're all stuff that I've made for in my free time or from school. So I would encourage you to find ways to work on expanding your portfolio in your free time. Some examples I pre previously mentioned is um, like a free online class. Esri has a what's called massive open online course called the MOOC. It's free for anyone to enroll and it literally started or starts this week. Um, so you could register for that, put in a couple hours a week and um, output some really, really pretty maps to put in to your portfolio. Another thing that you could do is set a personal goal on creating some new content. It could be uh, one map a quarter, a month, or if you're super crazy, like a thousand of us last year, you could participate in the 30 day map challenge. This is this happens every November where people across Twitter, across the internet are sharing one map that they made every single month or every single day. Um, and it's, it's challenging, but it's really rewarding and it fills up your portfolio with 30 new maps. So I encourage you to check out the 30daymapchallenge.com um, to learn more about it. And even if you're not interested in the challenge, there's tons of links in there for people who did complete it and have some really cool maps that's definitely worth checking out and serves as an inspiration for creating your own content. Now, it doesn't just have to be GIS work. So um, you can include GIS activities without a map. So like um, you can describe what you did for a particular workflow for a particular analysis. First, I did a buffer here and then I clipped it and then I dissolved it. Um, if you did a lot of statistics and created a table with an output from GIS data, that's worthwhile to include in there. Any scripts that you write, anything like that can help show what you're able to do. You can also include non-GIS projects that show related technical computer skills. So for example, if you've done any work with AutoCAD or any graphic design, data database, 
that's worthwhile to include as well as um, showing related interests and skills. So if you've done any research, have any publications, done some field work, attended conferences, um, definitely put some pictures or um, shout outs to those. You can also include your testimonials and recommendations. So from people that you've made maps for, people you've worked with, any of your colleagues or your teachers in there. One thing that's cool, if you're on LinkedIn, you're able to request a recommendation from your connections on there. So you could um, use that as an easy way to bridge the gap for asking for one of those. And then you can include miscellaneous interests and activities. So you might have noticed on mine, I have a whole section dedicated to memes. And at first I thought that was pretty silly. Uh, to include in there, but I had a couple of people reach out saying, no, these are really good. You should have them on there. They show that you know GIS because you're making fun of a concept in GIS. Um, so my portfolio has memes on it. So it, again, it's kind of up to you what you want to include in there and what you want to show off. Another question that I get a lot is, do I need more information about my work or can I just show a picture on there? And so I think it's really important to remember that one of the reasons why you're doing this is to show your value. So by adding some additional concept, uh, context, like I previously mentioned, right, you're adding, these are the skills I use, this is what I made it for, this is the feedback I got, you're emphasizing your strengths and your skill sets to your audience. One thing that I've kind of learned being on an interview panel and interviewing potential candidates is um, you don't want to leave anything up to assumption. If something doesn't come across in an interview, we don't really have an opportunity to clarify much. So we might have to assume you know or don't know something. So if you're adding more context, adding more information, you're making it much more clear for potential interviewers um, what you know. Um, so this is just a, a screenshot of, of that, of my portfolio that points out that skills use section. All right, so you've gathered your content. Great, now what? So you want to choose your tool and there's a lot of different options available to you. Um, you could create a website. So there's options like Wix and Google Sites, and WordPress, or you could create your own using um, JavaScript, HTML. You, there's actual sites made just for your portfolio. So this is like Behance. Um, another option that just came out is called spatialnode.net. Recommend writing that down, checking that out. That's a really cool new portfolio site just for geospatial people. It's called the Professional Network Built for Geospatial People. Um, and it's really easy to just plop your work in there, write up a description of what you did, and then give your personalized link um, to whoever you want to. So spatialnode.net is pretty cool. Another option is using kind of like a slide deck option. So creating it in PowerPoint, Google Slides, Canva, something like that. And then you can either export it to a PDF and attach that file somewhere, or there's ways to send a link in presentation mode. And so people can just kind of like click through it like they would a slideshow. We touch on this a little bit. Another great option is Story Maps. So this is an Esri tool that allows you to combine text with multimedia, with maps, videos, images, things like that. Um, one thing to note about Story Maps, um, this is again, an example, a great way to show, hey, not only do I know Esri technology, but I'm proving it to you by putting my stuff in an Esri uh, tool. Um, but one caveat is to make sure that you are aware which template you're using. Again, the classic version is now retired. So you wanna make sure that you're using the new stuff. And then also I would recommend creating a free public account to do that. Don't use like your school or your work account to create the story map on it because it is a pain to get it transferred if you leave or you graduate. All right, so I reached out to my network again, LinkedIn and Twitter to get some examples of GIS portfolios. Um, I got over 30 people responding, sharing what they had and in their input. 
Um, and so this is kind of a breakdown of how they were created. Um, majority was a website. We have a couple story maps, a couple on Behance, and I will note that this was before Spatial Node. So I bet that we have a lot more coming from there now that that's live. Now this looks like kind of a lame graph because over half of it is unknown. <laughs> um, but I wanted to break down of those that were a website, how did they create it? Um, and it wasn't very obvious for most of them, but you can see from, from the breakdown on the side there, a lot of them were created using Wix, um, WordPress, hosted on GitHub pages, things like that. Um, here's a quote from a senior GIS consultant who mentioned how he wanted to learn or get better at HTML and CSS uh, and JavaScript. And so he made his portfolio using that. And uh, it was a great learning process. And so I also had done something similar like that a couple of years ago. Um, I built kateberg.github.io. You can go check it out. It's kind of old. You can right click on it, click inspect and see my really poor, um, <laughs> poor programming there. Or, um, but it was a really great learning experience and I did enjoy doing it. The reason why I'm not doing it anymore is I'm kind of at a time in my life right now where it's too much work to add just a, a, um, a new project to it. And I'm turning out a lot more projects. So I wanted it to be a lot easier. And that's why I settled on the Wix website for me. But if you did want to go that route, um, from what I gather and what I did is that a lot of people just start by Googling HTML website template and you get a basic, um, basic starting point right there. And then you can customize the HTML, mess with it um, as you want. And then a great hosting for that is GitHub pages. All right, so we talked about gathering your content. We talked about what tool to use. And now I want to just kind of talk about having fun with it. So the last thing that you need is you, a little bit of you. And some things to think about is what do you want to communicate with this portfolio? What is your goal? What do you want to say about who you are? What kind of person are you? What makes you you? Um, and then take that and channel it into your design. So if you are a serious person, are you a casual person? Are you fancy? Do you like the outside? Are you minimalist? Who you are will come across in your work and in your portfolio, whether you like it or not. And I say, why don't you lean into that? Lean into it. Um, be conscious of your fonts and your colors and your placement of things and see and how that would represent you and come across to your audience. So here's just a couple examples of portfolios, just the header line, and you can see how different they are. Not one is the same, each has their own style, each has their own flair. So just take a second and think about who you wanna be and come across as. I'm gonna go back to that and you can look at it while I take a drink. Okay. All right, so you've built a great portfolio. You're done, right? That's all, That's it. You don't need to do anything else. There's a couple things that I would suggest you do. The first thing, number one thing, is make sure that you get feedback. Finishing your portfolio is great, um, but it's better to get some feedback and improve it. So you don't want the first person to have eyes on it, be a potential boss. Um, and by giving it to colleagues or peers or me, um, I'm happy to check out any of your portfolios and give you advice. Um, it improves the usability because you're having people actually testing the user interface, reading your content. Um, this is something that I did before I launched this more recent website. Um, and I got lots of feedback back, lots of improvements. I made a super stupid mistake. In some places I called it a project section and other places I called it a portfolio section. So things like that people can catch and make sure that you're more consistent overall. Um, first of all, if you don't have a LinkedIn, I would recommend you get one. It's a great place to network to look and find jobs. And if you don't want have, if you don't have one, I'd be happy to be your first connection on there. Uh, but LinkedIn has a uh, about section. You can add a link right there for it. 
and anyone who's checking out your profile can see it there. Make a post on there, share it with your network. And then there's also a new feature. I don't know if they've rolled it out to everyone yet, but um, it's this section at the bottom there called a featured section where you can pin different posts and links and things like that. So you can plop it right in there as well. All right, and um, you definitely wanna add it to your email signature and your resume. So this is a screenshot of my resume. I have the same header on both my resume and my cover letter. And I have my um, phone, email, LinkedIn link, and then also a link to my portfolio right there on the resume header. One thing to note, if you don't um, splurge to get your own custom URL, I would recommend using some kind of URL shortener to shorten it um, and customize that URL at the top, which is what I did right there. I like bit.ly.com. So my custom URL right there is bit.ly bit slash bergcatton. All right, um, if it's listed on your resume and it's listed on your cover letter on LinkedIn and things like that, it's likely that a potential employer would see it, uh, but you can draw even more attention to it in your cover letter. So for example, you could say something like, I have experience in XYZ, these skills are apparent in my uh, projects that are in my portfolio and I encourage you to check it out by visiting this website right here. So just direct them directly to it in your cover letter. And then you can also use it in interviews, not just to get interviews, but in interviews. So um, if you're in a virtual interview, I would recommend having your portfolio opened up on your computer before the interview even starts. And then if there's ever an opportunity that pops up, you can ask to share your screen and, and uh, show one of your projects that are in there. If you're doing an in-person interview, um, there's a couple options. When you're scheduling that interview, you can ask the contact if there's any access to a projector in the interview room that you could use. You could bring your own laptop to show it off, or you could bring a printout version of it to an interview. And I've done all three of those uh, back when in-person interviews were a thing. <laughs> Um, one thing that happens a lot in interviews is this thing called a situational question. So it's like, can you give me an example of a time when you did this? And that is a perfect opportunity to pull out your portfolio and say, yes, I did. You can see it right here. I use ArcGIS to do this, this, and this. Or QGIS. I'm not biased. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about portfolio best practices. The first thing is that it's accessible and it's alive. So by ex it's accessible, I mean that it is, um, that people can access it, uh, that it is inclusive of people with all kinds of backgrounds and abilities. So you wanna make sure that you are considering um, a lot of different aspects when you're putting together this portfolio. Some ways to do that is to use colors carefully. So as GIS professionals, um, I hope many of you are aware of how important it is that our projects are colorblind friendly. So that means not using red to green color scales, for example. Um, but it's also important to be mindful of that when we're creating our own portfolios. So Color Oracle is a really great colorblindness simulator that you can download and it will change your uh, monitor to kind of simulate what um, different colorblindness would look like. So you can see if things are, you're able to tell certain colors apart, for example. Um, there's also contrast checkers. So checking the difference between a foreground and a background. So for example, this it's accessible portion with the black text and the orange background here. I plugged in the black hex code and I plugged in the orange hex code to make sure that someone was able to see that and it has sufficient contrast. Using alternate text is a really important way to make sure your product is accessible. So 
pictures should have alt text. This is what screen readers use to describe an image to someone who might not be able to see it. Um, so your pictures should have the alt text so they can um, not just, sorry, you don't wanna just include what the picture's about. If there is text in it, it should include that in the alt text as well. Yes, and you'll also want to be conscious of using headings correctly. So header text is a very specific concept, um, whether in, you're in Microsoft Word or you're building a website, this is what a screen reader would use to jump through sections. There are different header, headers represent different sections to the screen reader um, and they use it to jump between things. So I remember in my early days, I would say, oh, this header text means that I would just make the font really big if I need to say something really big and really loud and, and make it look cool and draw attention to it. But that's defining a section in your portfolio to a screen reader. So you wanna be careful about your headings and only use it for headings. Heading text and only use it for headings. <laughs> you also wanna be careful with your links. So saying something like click here to see something is not, uh, is not very good. So screen readers will scan pages for links. And if your link doesn't have descriptive neck, link, uh, descriptive text, the link is pretty ineffective. So they're just going from click here to click here to click here and they don't know what that's responsible for. Um, so I would recommend saying something more um, effective like um, visit, visit this website to see X, Y, and Z or something like that. And lastly, since we spend so much of our time on the phone, you wanna make sure that your portfolio looks good on mobile devices. And one way to do this, for example, in your Chrome browser is to open developer tools. And right there, there's a device simulator. So you can go in and see what your site looks like on different devices, on an iPhone, on a Google Pixel, on anything you want, well, not anything, there's like, 20 common phone devices and tablet devices on there that you can click through. Another portfolio best practice is it's alive. And what do I mean by that? I mean that it's a living portfolio. I mean that you are continually updating it. You're not just making it and forgetting about it. You wanna make sure that it's not a static snapshot in time. Um, yeah. And the reason you want to do that is because things change. This is just a fact of life and your portfolio should change too. Um, over time, your set skill sets will expand, it'll advance, your work will diversify and improve, and even your style will change, may change. So having um, regular updates to your portfolio is an important way to make sure um, that you're staying up to date and showing off your value and your current uh, abilities to your audience. Regular reviews of your portfolio can also help you identify gaps in your training and suggest opportunities for growth for you. So if you check out your portfolio and you're like, oh, I don't really have a lot of experience with Python programming, maybe I should learn that a little bit more and include a project like that on my portfolio, for example. And the fact of the matter is that you've done the hard work of creating your portfolio already. So you wanna make sure that it doesn't go to waste by not updating it. And I think the best way to do this is to create an update and, and review plan. You can do this on a regular basis, whether it's monthly, whether it's quarterly um, or immediately, anytime that you have a new project that you wanna add, just add it on there really quickly so you don't forget. All right, so to wrap up, um, today we talked a little bit about how a portfolio can help show what you can do rather than tell. It helps highlight who you are, helps you secure opportunities, stand out from the crowd, and acts as kind of like a personal database of all your work and things that you've done. We talked about the steps to do it. You gather your content, you choose your tool, you have fun with it. Um, and then we briefly discuss some next steps with it and best practices. 
So I want to say good luck with your portfolio creation. I hope that this presentation gave you some good pointers uh, in developing your own portfolio. And I also want to say, again, please feel free to reach out to me um, if you have any questions. Uh, if you want someone to look over your work and get some advice on it, I'd love to see what you're doing. And I'd also love to have some feedback on this presentation. If it was helpful, was it not helpful at all? Please, please reach out, share your thoughts. Um, there's a lot of links here, but there are a lot of places where you can reach out and connect with me. So I hope that we can connect. Uh, Thank over you. to you, Matt. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. You asked for questions. Boy, boy, do you, do you have some questions? Oh, so. good, because I ended earlier. <sighs> That's all great. right <laughs> so uh and, and and some of them kind of came along similar lines so i'm i'm, I'm going to try to try to cluster them and make sure we can go through as many many topics as possible so um what's the magic number how much is too much uh how much should go into your portfolio uh, how, how many projects as many as you can the best ones when it gets too hard to navigate what are your thoughts on, on trying to, to find a good balance between uh, everything that can go in there versus everything that should go in there for your immediate purpose? Love the question. That's a great question. Uh, I would say it depends on what your audience is. Um, is this for you? Is this kind of like one of those personal databases like I talked about where you're just kind of putting your work on there? I would say you might want to include more. But if you're looking at this for potential interviewers, for potential clients, things like that, you got to think about your audience and how um, people don't spend a lot of time on a website unless it's really quick and easy to use, very interesting. So. I can't remember what it is. The average person spends like five seconds on a site before deciding to leave or something crazy like that. So you want to make sure that you have the important stuff at the top with the idea that maybe someone might not keep scrolling um, and might get not necessarily bored, but distracted with something else or turned away. Um, so I, I would say if your audience is like an interviewer or a client, I would try and keep it short and sweet and kind of cycle through your best stuff. All right, excellent. So we, we have a few questions about, you know, kind, kind of managing what goes into a portfolio. Um, so what are your thoughts on, do, do, do you recommend having a personal picture on there? If, if it's, it's more of a, uh, you know, a, uh, a interview tool, uh, what are your thoughts on including professional references? And kind of aligned with those, um, you know, you, you kind of talked about a LinkedIn page. You know, what, what's, what are your thoughts on duplicating content? If you have information on your LinkedIn page, do you think it's okay just to link out and not include it in your portfolio? Or do you think you should like education and awards, you know, try to keep them up and have them in both places? Great question. A lot of parts to that. Um, the let's see the first thing that I want to tackle is kind of the differences between LinkedIn versus your website. I guess it would kind of depend on how you're pushing it out. Are you only giving people the link to your portfolio? Are you also linking your LinkedIn? Um, so if you're mainly focusing on your portfolio link, I would try and put a lot of stuff in there. One thing that I do for all of my job applications is I tailor every single resume to the particular company that I'm applying to. So I'm making sure that the words that are in the job application uh, are in my resume somehow and kind of tailoring it that way. And so with that, I have my LinkedIn is very vague and broad because it can differ between people who are viewing it. Um, so that's one thing that you wanna keep in mind is, is who's going to be viewing this if you want to tailor it to certain people, you probably want to try and keep it as consistent as possible. So someone doesn't see one thing on one site and see something on another and it's contradictory, that would be the worst case scenario. But if they're just, they just don't line up at all, um, that could be confusing to a potential employer. So I would try and make it aligned um, as you can in that respect. Uh, in terms of having your personal picture on there, that's, that's also up to you. Um, I, one of the examples I showed Oops, there's scuba again. One of the examples I showed here, 
this website for Trevor has no pictures of him whatsoever. It's just his work, what he does, his GitHub links and a LinkedIn link right here. And that's absolutely fine. I don't think you need to have a picture um, in there at all because that's not really the point. The point is to show off your work. Did I tackle all of them, Matt? Uh, what are your thoughts on professional references? I, I, I guess maybe the answer is if your references were okay with it, you know, you could put it, put them in there, give them the heads up. Um, yeah, I would absolutely ask the person who did the, the reference or the recommendation. Are you talking about like having the name, like contact these people for a reference for me? Or are you talking about like a testimonial, like this person wrote a quote about how I'm awesome? That, that, that's, that's probably a good point because if someone was okay with providing language describing the awesomeness of, of what you've done, you know, it's probably okay to put a quote in there. It's, it's probably a, a tip in the teeter totter a little bit if you're providing somebody else's contact information, you know, unless it's, uh, you know, a link to a publicly available web page or, or something like that. So, so some, uh, some professors might be okay with that, you know, if, if, uh, if they have a web page at their university or college, for example. Yeah, uh, I, would, I, would probably, I would probably steer away from putting someone else's contact information on here unless ask them for it or just don't do it. People really ask for a reference in a job application and that's a very specific setting. And in that case, it would hopefully already be in your application or resume. So I don't think that's necessary for a portfolio. Yeah, and, and, and that's a good point. It's, it's a, if you're using this for a job, you're already submitting everything to apply for the job. This is just uh, um, an, an, an extra tool uh, to communicate um, some of what you'd like to show about yourself on your terms, you know, rather than uh, the terms that are constrained by a job application. Uh, okay, um, so sometimes we do work that may not easily show in maps and graphics. You know, if we're a, a DBA or we do project management uh, or uh, the work that we do is covered by NDAs or, or other um, a systems type thing, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to show it graphically. Now, uh, you know, we could always work that in in other ways and in, in, in the portfolio by, by listing skills and, and describing things, you know, th that we've done or, or saying, you know, hey, we've done it or here are a job, here are the responsibilities. But, but that doesn't seem to really get at some of the, the graphic and visual nature of, of what a portfolio uh, really leads to or, or speaks to. Do you have any other ideas or strategies of, of how you can work around the, eh, it's boring or I really can't talk about it uh, other than just listing it in text and saying that you've done it? Yeah, and I, I keep saying, I think it goes back to your audience. Um, if your potential employer wants to know that you did these DBA stuff, that you did these complex stuff, they will find it interesting and they will want to read into it and read that boring, boring text, right? Um, but if a potential employer doesn't need that skill, then they will just overlook it and look at something else on your portfolio. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to have boring text on there. I think some, some people will find it interesting. Um, and... I'll point back to, I keep doing that, <laughs> point back to this particular site that I like. They not just, they do not only have their projects in there, they also have a link to their GitHub. So you can go right directly there and see the work that they've worked on. Um, boring work. It's not boring work, but it's less pretty, less visually representative than some of this other stuff. All right. Excellent. So uh, there is a question about, do you recommend using tags to search and sort different kinds of projects? Uh, what platforms or what technologies would support tagging? I like that. I, I love tagging. That's something that I did on that um, GitHub site that I mentioned briefly. This is my experiment in HTML. And I love, uh, I found a template, an HTML template that had this kind of, you can tag spatial analyses, you can tag cartography, story maps, and then they can filter like that. I love it. 
Um, I haven't really seen it in a lot of places except for these custom build uh, sites. All right. And how does your current employer feel about having such an impressive portfolio? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Interesting. All right. So I think we, we've touched on, uh, on all the questions. Um, and so uh, we are going to bounce it over to Tim Nolan, a member of the ERISA board, to uh, help us wrap up. Well, first of all, Kate, that was fantastic. Uh, and uh, if you get a chance, uh, I'm going to go ahead and copy it now. Uh, you should take a look through the chat. So many accolades, so many examples of other portfolios that I think we're going to pull together. Uh, great job. Uh, what I wanted to do is just share a little bit about uh, ERISA and about, you know, invite everyone to become a member if you're not. And, uh, and I want to start with uh, emerging, you know, some of the features that it has out there as emerging leaders, like the Vanguard cabinet, which Kate is a member of. Uh, she's select, she'll be a member for, th I think it's a three-year uh, bid. Uh, there's some GIS prep opportunities. There's a lot of professional uh, resources like workshops and this fantastic Webby we just had today. Um, Conferences, they have tons and tons of conferences. Uh, one is uh, the uh, GIS Valuation uh, Technology Conference, which is gonna be next month, later than the next month. But GIS Pro, I think is the uh, premier uh, cross, uh, uh, cross organizational uh, GIS conference. And that's gonna be in Boise in October. Uh, the, uh, the GLA, I was just looking through the audience uh, uh, who's attending today. And there was a lot of alumni that I, I was at the GLA in uh, Minneapolis uh, last, uh, last December. I saw some colleagues there, uh, and I know there's a lot of others. Uh, there was a professional magazine that you can kind of get your stuff published in. GIS Core, if you're into uh, uh, if you're into volunteering, a lot of job postings and other types of publications. Uh, there's a lot of career development stuff. Uh, you, there's local chapters if you want to be part. If you're a member, but then you're in, in kind of a region. There's a lot of chapters throughout uh, all of North America. Uh, there's a, a Connect, which is a really nice feature to kind of share information for members only. Uh, that you can kind of, you know, get, get content that you need that, uh, that, you know, from your colleagues. Mentorship, there's a, G a GSP certification uh, opportunity there, networking. And if you like being recognized, I've never been part of an organization that doesn't, you know, that recognizes more than, uh, than, uh, than ERISA does. Uh, there's a Young Professional Scholarship, a GIS Hall of Fame, which is awesome. Uh, and right now it's open, if you're interested, uh, the Exemplary Systems and uh, Government, the ESIG Award. Uh, that you can submit for for uh, that will be revealed at the uh, GIS Pro. So, so those are just a few things I just wanted to share about uh, what ERISA has to offer, and it's just a, an absolute pleasure to be part of that board and and to host and and have events like what Kate just did today. So, thank you very much, Kate and Matt, and giving me the opportunity of a little time to share. All right, thanks, Tim. And as we are wrapping up. Uh, this event, uh, we, uh, we do have a, a couple more events coming up. Uh, our next uh, webinar is uh, March 1st uh, on machine learning and demystifying uh, machine learning. That's definitely a term that, that, that we hear quite a bit about. Uh, Tim mentioned the Exemplary Systems and Government uh, Awards. The current application is, uh, is open, but we do have six webinars scheduled uh, starting in March and every month until we get through all six, uh, 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 portraying, uh, uh, having uh, the, the, uh, the award winners from last year uh, talking about their projects and where they came from and, and how that's impacted uh, the, uh, um, how GIS has positively impacted the work in, in their organizations, uh, ranging from uh, local to, uh, to state and, and in some ways federal uh, projects. So it's in some ways, it's a tour around uh, the world. Uh, with uh, with what we'll see coming up um, with the GISP exam uh, 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 coming up in June, we do plan to offer another live Q and A study session uh, for those that are preparing and studying for it. And we are working on scheduling uh, another one of the full day GISP exam prep workshops. So virtually, we're looking at April for that, and so hopefully we can uh, we can get that in there for folks that would like that opportunity. Uh, for uh, the, uh, the June exam. Uh, we're also uh, continue to offer uh, ERISA workshops uh, uh, virtually. Uh, in addition to the exam prep uh, later in July, 
Uh, we're going to have two afternoons of the Decrypting Risk, Resilience, and Social Vulnerability Data and Indicators workshop. So all of those are great uh, uh, virtual uh, uh, opportunities uh, to continue your uh, professional education. Please follow URISA on social media uh, or uh, visit the URISA website, uh, urisa.org, for uh, information on that. Uh, Tim mentioned that there are opportunities to see GIS people in real life coming up. Uh, the GIS Valtech conference uh, later this month, uh, GIS Pro in Boise in October, and uh, GIS Leadership Academy scheduled for Philadelphia in August. Uh, so those are all great opportunities. Uh, and finally, you know, thank you, Kate, uh, for sharing your own GIS passion, experience, and expertise. Uh, for everybody in attendance, if you have your own GIS passion, experience, expertise that you'd like to share with the, with the ERISA community and the GIS profession, uh, please reach out to us at ERISA and the Professional Education Committee uh, so we can share your passion, experience, and expertise with a broader audience. So thank you all for your uh, attendance. And uh, Kate, thank you so much uh, for sharing with us uh, and uh, we'll look forward, everyone, uh, to having the, the recording uh, up, um, up and available uh, next week. Uh, if you're not sure where to look, uh, check out the ERISA website or uh, social media. We'll make sure it gets out there, it gets publicized. Everybody have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for stopping by.